all right so we are back and now we're talking about so we were talking about how the c3b opsonized the pathogen into macrophage ate that there is a reason that i'm i'm touching on complement the, the the reason is that it works together with the immunoglobulins this way of complement activation is the mbl pathway of complement activation complement is activated in three ways mbl pathway is one that is the one you're seeing here the second pathway is where there is a alternate pathway and what is that that some of these pathogens you know that the neutrophils and macrophages are eating these pathogens up and they are throwing so let's say if this is a neutrophil it has engulfed this pathogen pathogen is quite unhappy and quite sad but hey, that is the life of a pathogen so these are the antigens on it and this neutrophil is going to cook it up right remember it does the oxygen burst and it causes the the pathogen to actually become burnt up by oxygen it takes the electrons out of it so when it is going to cook it up and break it up it's going to release those antigens out in the serum so neutrophil is slightly interesting it it engulfs it and then it can release those out in the serum as in, in in the fluids as well on the other hand macrophages they actually put it on the mhc and they present it outside so these are antigen presenting cells however neutrophils are not and because of that they just release those in in the interstitium now these antigens are present in the serum or in the interstitium or into the blood wherever the the infection is what happens with these the alternate pathway of the complement fixation is where these endotoxins not exotoxins these were exotoxins the endotoxin that is the break product from inside the pathogen bacteria after it has been broken up those endotoxins that have been released these would cause the activation of the uh, uh, complement system and that activation has a different chemical pathway uh, we're not talking about the complement at this time but that is alternate pathway so alternate pathway is another now remember this in complement mannon mannon binding pathway and alternate pathway are part of innate arm of immune system why because these both systems become active without recognizing what the pathogen is of what type of pathogen it is right so they don't need recognition they do not need memory to be attacking it now let's go to the third pathway the third pathway for the complement fixation is called the classic pathway and that classic pathway needs classic pathway needs immunoglobulin to be present immunoglobulin to be present and now tada this lecture today is about the immunoglobulin right so here is where we are going to tie how does immunoglobulin work with the complement system and uh, trigger the complement fixation complement fixation simply means this the, there are two things so so let me complete this thought as well so when complement pathway reaches up to c3 and the c3b is created <coughs> c3b acts as an opsonin that is one way then what happens is when the complement pathway continues it activates it activates 5 and then 6 7 these two then activate 8 and 9 so at the end of the day what happens is on the surface of the pathogen so i'm going to make this pathogen here in black just for the ease so let's say that pathogen is here right so this is a very happy pathogen he thinks that he has gotten it all he is inside the body he has conquered the world but he doesn't know that c5 got split into c5b c5b and c5a c5a acts as a chemotactic factor for the neutrophils so he's standing out there saying neutrophils come here we got a pathogen so pathogen doesn't know that an army is being called by the c5a c5b with c4 c3 and c2b's the activated complements these activate 6 and 7 complement proteins 6 and 7 when they become activated they activate 8 and 9 at the end of the day there is a complex that is formed that complex is made up, made up of c5b 7 8 and 9 6789 9. this complex is called membrane attack complex 
What that is, is it sits on the surface of the pathogen. and it punctures a hole in it. It is like a drill, it's like an arrow, it's like a bullet that punctures a hole into the surface. That is why it's called membrane attack complex. It attacks the membrane. So it sits down there and creates a hole. Once that hole is created, the bacteria, the pathogen, or whatever is in there, leaks out and the pathogen dies. So the eye would be out here, this happy face, happy mouth, will be sitting out here and the bacteria is really just dead. Right? So that is how the membrane attack complex works. And in pathologies, in our own pathologies where our body goes wrong, this membrane attack complex can actually attack us as well, our cells as well, and it can break them. So this is its normal physiological function. But when the immune system goes wrong, it can actually create membrane attack complexes that can attack our own cells and kill them as well. And that is how many autoimmune diseases can occur. So anyways, this is the complements pathway. One thing, so we were talking about that the pathogen came into our body for the first time. Neutrophils attacked it, macrophages attacked it, and the complement system became active. This part, now remember, this part has not become active yet. Classic pathway of the complement fixation or activation they, they both can be used, the words can be used together, at fixation or activation. That has not become active yet. Why not? Because innate, the, the classic pathway is part of a choir arm. Why? Because classic pathway needs immunoglobulin. And immunoglobulin can only come from the choir arm when the B cells become active. And B cells become active when the T helper cells make them active. T helper cells will be activated when the macrophages make them active. Right? So, considering that, we are still figuring out when will the classic pathway be, be become active. So let's go there. I'm going to erase this thing and we are going to start with the, actually just some parts here. And we are going to start with how the immunoglobulins will come into the play. So now you know when the pathogen came in, the uh, complement pathway became active, the pathogen became opsonizable, it was eaten up by neutrophils and phagocytes, it was broken up and the mm, antigens came out, right? These antigens that are sitting, remember this pathogen is triangle and the, the square, so these antigens, these triangle and squares and many other pieces, they would be in the interstitium, they will be in, the, in that area wherever the pathogen is being broken down. So infection is here, so maybe there. From there, lymphatics will bring these things to lymph nodes. Right? So this is a lymph node. So what did lymphatic channels are doing? They are draining the fluid from the interstitium. So from here, that little scratch that I had in the pathogen which was in there, uh, that may be uh, staphylococcus or streptococcus, something like that. Now the broken up pieces have been brought into the lymph node. In the lymph node now, the B cells, remember the T cell helping the B cells and B cells becoming active. So the B cells sitting here, so let's say this is a B cell which sits here in the germinal center of the lymph node. So the B cell sitting here has now immunoglobulin M and immunoglobulin B on its surface. So this is the first thing. From the lecture number 11, you know this thing that when a B cell matures, what it does is it creates the very first gene production, immunoglobulin production, that a B cell does is IgM and IgD. So remember, immunoglobulin, two immunoglobulins can be produced by one B cell at one time, D and M. Most of those are just attached on the surface of the uh, B cell. We talked about it in our last lecture, I'm not repeating it. These act as receptors. So now the IgM and IgD are present on a B cell and this B cell is, let's say, it can recognize this, the triangular, um, sorry, this is triangular, triangular pathogen so, or antigen. So now that triangular antigen comes and attaches. This is actually not the right place to attach. Let's attach it 
where it should attach right so here the antigen has attached to the antibodies this will cause the B cell to become active and become plasma cell and make immunoglobulins so considering that we are reaching a point where we are we're trying to understand that immunoglobulins will become active or B cell will become active let's see the kind of immunoglobulins and their functions and we will come back to this part of the story so do not forget about this and let's see what we are going to study so come here for a second in our lecture today we'll be talking about the structure we have talked about the structure before but today in specific we'll talk about monomer dimer and multimer what does that mean for immunoglobulin we'll talk about what are the percentages of various immunoglobulins in plasma or in serum more specifically we'll talk about weights of immunoglobulins which immunoglobulin is heavier than which other uh, immunoglobulin we'll talk about age chains of the immunoglobulins what kind of age chains immunoglobulins have we'll talk about opsonization just like c3b causes opsonization immunoglobulins also help with the opsonization we'll talk about that complement fixation active passive immunity and booster doses uh, transplacental passage which immunoglobulin goes to the this is a very common set of questions for the USMLE where students are asked about all of these things transplacental passage is very important as well uh, because the baby who's born doesn't make a lot of of his own uh, immunoglobulins he makes some IgM and A but very minor so primarily he's getting the immunoglobulins from the mother the ones that had had crossed the placenta and the one that are present in colostrum or mother's milk then allergic response and what is the role of immunoglobulin in those responses then what immunoglobulins are found in the secretions then what B cell receptors are we just talked about IgM and IgD we'll talk about memory B cell that have IgG as a as a receptor we'll talk about J chain so some immunoglobulins are present in uh, combined together as an aggregate so J chain is present there secretory components then primary and secondary response we are actually talking about the primary response right now and then what uh, what happens in the allergy so again here and then catalytic function of the immunoglobulin so these are the kind of things that we need to cover so let's start from here structure or what do we mean by monomer dimer and pentamer these are or multimer right so come back here we'll leave this story here for the time being we will continue from this story let's treat the immunoglobulins a little bit so the first thing what are immunoglobulins where are these found what are their types so first let's do this we have blood of course blood has two primary components it has cells and you know that cells there are white blood cells and red blood cells and platelets and so on then it has plasma plasma is what is plasma plasma is the water with the electrolytes plus the sugars kind of electrolytes or non electrolyte uh, particles then it has the um, proteins clotting factors so these things together form plasma when you put plasma in a tube the clotting factors clot and the rest is called the serum so plasma is further um, divided into plasma is plasma so and serum so instead of doing this let me just say blood fluids plasma and serum right so it's cells and fluids cells and fluid fluid is divided into plasma and serum and really the serum is the plasma negative subtracting the clotting factors clotting factors if you take them out then that becomes serum now when you pick up serum or you pick up plasma and you electrophorose that when you pass that you put that on a piece of paper so what happens is let's say here is a piece of paper on that piece of paper you have a negative charge here and you have a positive charge here and you put some blood plasma onto this so you pour that plasma here you know that the plasma proteins are usually negatively charged physiologically plasma proteins are negatively charged what does that mean proteins are actually globular structures so inside them are positive charges 
but outside them are negative charges. In some pathological conditions, for example, acid-base balances, these charges can become reversed and that is how we start getting those tetanies and stuff like that. But anyways, mostly these are negatively charged proteins. When the proteins are, when the plasma is poured here, on a piece of paper, blotting paper, and then you've got positive and negative electrodes and you run the current through that, what happens is the negatively charged proteins, they get pushed away by the negative and they are pulled by the positive. Right? And then depending upon their size, depending upon the charge, amount of charge, and the smaller the size, the faster the protein can go to the other side, the proteins are going to run from here towards the positive. So some proteins, the one which are more thin and that have gotten more negative charges, these would reach here. These are called albumins. You know that albumin are the smallest plasma proteins. That is why albumin can actually become filtered through the glomerular filtration uh, you know, barrier very easily. Then there are other proteins and then finally uh, whatever is the heaviest protein that finishes their clotting factors and other things like that. So now in this, is, this process is called electrophoresis, plasma electrophoresis. In this thing over here, the, there is a band formed here of the proteins that is called alpha, beta and gamma proteins. So alpha, beta and gamma proteins. Gamma protein band as part of the electrophoresis is where the immunoglobulins are found. So that is why immunoglobulins are also called gamma globular proteins. Why do we keep calling them globular? Because these are three dimensional structures, these are globular, these are rounded, these are big. So gamma Globular proteins are immunoglobulins, right? So now in here, so if I make a graph of this thing, and if I say uh, this is the molecular weight, and I say here is the charge or the concentration in the plasma, you'll see that albumins have a higher concentration than alpha, beta, and then gamma have some concentration and so on. So gamma band has the immunoglobulins which are IgG, IgM, Ig, let me say A, IgM, IgE, and IgD. So in short, immunoglobulins are called immunoglobulins. They are, they, they are proteins that are globular. They are proteins that are gamma globular proteins on electrophoresis. These are proteins that are taking part in the immune system, so that is why immunoglobulins. These are part of serum. These are part of plasma. These are part of blood. So they're present in the blood, in plasma, but if you make the serum, they are also present in the proteins of the serum in the gamma band. They make about 20% of the overall proteins. Out of these, then the IgG is most abundant protein. I, I was watching somebody's lecture and I saw that he said IgM is the most abundant. IgG is the most abundant protein. About 75% is taken by the IgG and then the other proteins they come later on. And IgE is the least abundant protein. And the other important thing for the aminoglobulins is, please remember this, IgG is the smallest we will use this concept of the smallest IgG for our purpose when we talk about the transplacental transportation. So let's stop here and we'll continue in another, another minute. Thank you.